Hello, everybody. This is Stu Smith and Jeff Nichols, and we're going to be doing the tactical fitness report, this time on more about stress than uh, overtraining. And if you think about what we talked about last time, overtraining, this is kind of like what happens to you if you don't take care of that overtraining symptom, All right? So, so in there are several levels of stress that we don't want to get into like psychological stress. You know, we're not going to deal with that animal. Um, but roughly speaking, you know, all stress is very related because it's all about the same stress hormones, just different levels that are pumping through your body, depending on what you're doing. If you're getting ready to take a PT test and you got butterflies in your stomach, that is stress, maybe a form of anxiety a little bit anxiety, yep. stress, but still the same hormones, you know, the same hormones when you can't pay a bill at the end of the month and you're stressed out about that, you know, same type of hormones going through your body, stressing you out. So there are things in life and work and training that all stress us out and it's not all bad. You know, that some of that stress makes us perform better. You know, I, I know I perform better when I give myself a deadline, right? And a right. self-imposed deadline or a customer gives me a deadline and I'm performing focus. I'm more focused. Uh, adrenaline's going, I got to get this done, you know, just have more energy for it. And that's, that's an adrenaline response to, you know, your self-imposed stress, you know, sure. like, and you can also screw up your sleep by, you know, just thinking, you know, if you just think about something that is stressful, like for, for Jeff, if we're both fathers, you know, if somebody, if you just thought like your son or daughter is hurt, you know, or like somebody hurt them or did something mean to them, it can keep you up all night pissed off. For sure. You know, because you're just, you're just ticked off or, or any other life or death situation that goes on in your head can keep you up for hours. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want to turn it over to Jeff here real quick and get his intro to stress because he's got some great things to discuss because there's a lot of symptoms in there that you know, are very similar to the overtraining symptoms. This just takes it up another notch. And we're going to talk about how to deal. One of the best questions we had was how to deal with overtraining symptoms. All right, once you're starting to get those and you need to take a break, how do you really take a break? So right. it's all yours, Jeff. Yeah, I think that one of the points that we would like to make for you all is that BUDS is the perfect example where the lot of this plays out because if you show up, and you're not really stressed out, like really like kind of probably not going to perform very well. It sounds crazy. We actually really need you to be stressed out to perform at a high level. And that's a whole other brain piece uh, that John Sullivan and some other sports psychologists have talked about, but, and we can reference some of the books or some of the articles or whatever in later on, but we want to stress the physical body out. When we stress it out, the body, will either respond really well or really poor. Now, the more you get, and we keep saying this word stress inoculation that Dave Grossman, Colonel Dave Grossman mm -hmm. talks about. Uh, we, we need you to expose you to it, expose you to it. And that's what this physical or physical training does for guys. We're trying to expose you to these physical stressors. So you encounter them like in the PST and buds. That's not the first time you've experienced it. So we do want to stress you out. So let's be very clear about that. We want to really stress you out but we want to do it in a very regimented systematic way to get a positive adaptation. Now, the thing is, is we, we get so acclimated to training. Well, sometimes I, I always explain stress, your ability to handle stress is a big bowl. The fluid inside that bowl is the stress. We either got to make the bowl, bowl bigger to handle more stress, or we got to create a nice drain that can drain the stress as it comes in. Or ideally we get a big bowl and a nice big drain. So that's kind of the way I explain stress to a lot of people. Um, and then just like the, the word bank that Stu had posted on the link on the previous uh, tactical fitness report is that there are, again, what, regardless if you're training for a PST or you just had a terrible day or your dog peed, a, your brand new puppy peed on the brand new rug or whatever it is, like there, stress is stress is stress is stress. The manifestation for buds the butterflies anxiety can happen at any point and they really are kind of the same. The brain isn't necessarily going to decipher what it is. It's going to decipher how you've handled it. So the word bank, and I'm going to read through these and these are in no order. 
Um, but just keep in mind, we're, uh, you know, we're going to frame it as, Hey, this is PST. This is buds. This is Ranger school. This is the military boot camp. This is physical training. So, uh, one of the, th the three, I kind of lump, these are kind of grouped together because I say frequent urination, diarrhea, and constipation. They're, they're gastrointestinal issues, and they can be, they can all show up, one can show up. And a again, what we're talking about stress is we're, you're going to experience these things, but if, you, if they become habitual, they will start really impacting performance. I mean, they're going to show up, they're going to come and go. There's nothing we do about that, but again, Frequent urination, diarrhea, and constipation. Um, and there's like, for example, in the sport world we, or, or in the tactical world, Dave Grossman calls it the battle craps. Mm. And when you get in the tactical pocket, you'll see it when you get to buds. What, you, what I would suggest is get your bowel movement done. <laughs> so when you go to train, what's going to end up happening is your body's going to go, I don't have time and energy to digest this food in your stomach. So you're either going to throw it up or you're going to get diarrhea until you start handling that new stress, that new the, the morning runs, the morning swims, the morning PTs. That's why kind of we've talked about getting up not super early or getting up early, get acclimated, training, training on a full stomach or training with food in your stomach. That's why I want you to do it now so you don't show up to buds and go, I've never had breakfast. I don't eat breakfast. You show up there, you're going to have to eat. So yeah. on those things, you have any things too? Um, yeah, I mean, like you said, digestive issues are – probably one of the first symptoms of stress and you'll probably start feeling them as butterflies and then those butterflies turn to throwing up obviously a lot of people throw up sometimes it's um sometimes it's stress sometimes it's just they probably had too much in their stomach you know right. while they're uh doing a pst or something like that i i personally like to sip you know some form of sugar water gatorade you know, juice or something while I'm going through a PST because I know I'm about to put out on that run. And typically after about 20, 30 minutes of putting out on your PT and your swim, you're about, you're about burned out of all your glycogen and energy. So, sure. you, you know, you, so you got to really, unless you're, unless you can do a really fast run and be aerobic, which I know you're a great runner. You probably can. If you're, you have to gut check that run every time you're going to be anaerobic for that eight, eight and a half, nine minute run. Yeah. So for sure, which, which requires a lot of sugar, you know, a lot yep. of glycogen. So it does. that's why I always do that. So, I mean, there are ways to obviously improve your performance while being stressed. Nutrition is one of them. Um, one of the great questions that we had after we did our overtraining uh, podcast was what do you do when you have all these symptoms? not all of them, obviously, but several of these symptoms and you see negative gains are starting to occur. So what, what, what would your first recommendation be on that one? You know, if they, if they start showing, you know, again, what, what I want you to all kind of box in is you know, some of these symptoms that we'll go through here and we're going to keep going through and talk about, you know, if it shows up once or twice, it might be pretty easily to identify the, the reason but if you, if you, every time you train, you, you have, you know, have this nervousness that you can't expel or you have, you know, you get, we call them bubble guts, you get diarrhea and you feel like you got to go take a poo or whatever. The first thing that we got to do is we got to start looking at the bigger picture. Okay. Is this number one, is it impeding my performance? Is it detracting from my performance? Is it becoming now, is it becoming, you're not going to get in the, down the road, but if it's always happening and you show up for another PST, you're like, man, like it gets in your head. Just like Stu alluded to, like as being a parent and you, you know, start worrying about the welfare of your children, it gets in your head. So when it starts getting in your head and it starts phys physically affecting you, the first thing we got to do is we got to step back and reassess. Got to go, okay, am I doing something wrong? Wrong being for me for a long time, uh, I used to eat a lot of oatmeal in the morning, which I do, but I don't, that doesn't suit me very well for very intense activity. I've got, I had to, I have to switch to cream of rice. It's easy. Like that's what babies, it's easier on the stomach. It's baby. I use Gerber babe cream of rice. That's what I train when I'm going to train really early or really intense. I use cream of rice instead of oatmeal. It's easier on my stomach. The body doesn't freak out. So that's the big thing is like evaluate. Okay. What am I putting in my body? And then the piece is, okay, am I, have I prepared for it? 
That's the other side. Did I sleep the night before? Did I not? Did I fuel? Or really, a lot of guys we talked about before, guys show up to boot camp completely unprepared or whatever, and they're like, well, I thought they would just get me in shape at boot camp. Yeah. So th there's a lot of things. There's, those are the big four. Did I prepare? What did I put in my body? How did I sleep? And how well hydrated am I? Or is it a totally new experience? So I would expect that if it's the first time you've done your PST, unless you've had a lot of competition, sport competition, athletic competition, like for me, my first PST wasn't a huge, I mean, it was important to me, don't get me wrong, but it didn't throw me into like an emotional frenzy where I just shut down. A lot of guys I know, I've, a couple of guys I've trained, they're like machines in the gym. But then you put them under the auspice of a clock or a mentor or a, a seal or something where it matters. And one of the guys just could, he just kept, he couldn't stop throwing up. He didn't even, they didn't even let him finish PS, his PST. Right. Yeah. I've seen that as well. So um, another thing too, when he, when Jeff's talking about things that work for him, especially early in the morning, you know, to, that, that soothes his stomach, you have to find what works for you. Yep. Not, not everybody likes, cream of rice or likes to do, you know, bananas and apples in the morning. You know, I, I personally like a, some juice and a banana, you know, that works real well for me. I, when I was going through buds, I liked uh, baby carrots and apple slices. You know, that, that, that worked really well for me. Uh, yeah. um, I, not in the morning, first in the morning, but you know, throughout the day I would snack on those in a, you know, Ziploc pocket that I, or bag that I had in my pocket. Um, or I just kept it in the locker. Uh, you know, that, that little bit of helps. Um, you know, so find what works for you pre-test, during the test, you know, after the test, yeah. or whatever, you know, event that you're doing. And you can test that out with your workouts. And now, because now is the time to test it. Yeah. We, we don't, we, what we don't want you to do, unless you absolutely have to, is to show up at Bud's and then create a routine. Like, you're going to be on the routine. We're talking about like, okay, well, I've never had snacks and I'm lethargic at buds. Well, now's, now's the time to figure out like, heck, if it, if it's rice crispy treats, just to get some, get you through yeah. training, the morning training to get you to breakfast. Right. right. That's cause you're going to do at buds. You're going to do the Monday early 4am runs or 4:30 a.m. runs before breakfast. Yeah. So that's the other side too, is when you stress out the organism post, most of you probably don't feel like sitting down and eating right after a workout, like immediately. In buds, your five-mile run will turn into an immediate one-mile jog to eat. Yeah. You'll get done, and they'll be like, hey, man, we got to get to the cafeteria, and we, you, you'll run to yeah. the cafeteria. So you've got to get used to having your body feed itself or fuel itself, rather, um, pre and post. Now yeah, is the yeah, time to do it. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you what, I, I wasn't – you know, that aware of having to work out with a full belly, but something definitely evolves by the way yep. to uh, allow you to, if, if you're starting to see success um, with your training, um, with, with your buds training, you will realize that your body is just naturally adapting to that cycle as For well. Sure. So, um, yep. so, how about this? Uh, so we talk about, you know, when you're starting to feel those little effects of overtraining, you got to really check out your sleep, your nutrition, your hydration, you know, all the electrolytes and everything like that. You know, what you're getting into your, into your body, fuel and sleep, you know, cause that, yep. those, those are your main recovery tools. However, you know, you also got to take a look at, at your training. You know, is your yep. training set up in a way that maybe you're you're not resting muscle groups or you're running six days a week, you know, or, yep. or whatever, and you're not taking a day off, you know, you know, sometimes you just need to take a day off, you know, or, or maybe even do a mobility day in the middle of the week. That's something I have really started to add yep. into my training is um, probably like day three, day four is just nice, non-impact, focus on my breathing. And and you engage that parasympathetic side of your nervous system by just, you know, nice, slow, aerobic breathing. Yeah, you know, that's why, you know, people don't really like long distance runs as far as a training method to prepare for buds. I mean, it's a good way to get volume, but you, know, you don't really need them necessarily for that, but it is a good way to 
you know, get that parasympathetic side of your nervous system yeah. going as long as the impact of running is not hurting you. Yeah. That's why yeah. I, at my age, you know, I just prefer to go on the non-impact machines and do it yeah. and focus on that breathing. And it really does de-stress you. And that, that's really what that is, is all about. For sure. Yeah. That's why I just say my, my, my gym here at the house is set up now where I've got, I've got my cable TV and I don't watch a whole lot of TV, but I have my, my air attack bike in the garage with, with my TV and everything. And I just, I, like last night, I just put on the new aliens movie and just rode nice and easy for 25 nice. minutes. Cause it's just, you get to a point where sometimes like I always say locomotion is lubrication, but I wasn't trying to stress myself out. Yep. That that's again, for people that have a hard time taking days off, that is the first alternative is go for a 15 minute walk, go for ride a bike, something, but yeah, you're right on the, the, again, probably you're right. The, the number one thing we want to look at is what's the training? Like what, do I need to reevaluate my training? Is am I <clears throat> too intense, too often, too frequent, whatever it is? Because, you know, that's that's what's causing it. Probably is yeah. too too much, too often, or just strung too many days together. Yeah. Like, you know, a four or five day training session is probably not going to stress you out. But you start stretching out to twenty and thirty days without a break, mm -hmm. it oh, certainly yeah. will. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't take long <clears throat> for consistent training to evolve into negative results for sure yeah agreed yeah yep <clears throat> what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to run through this last word bank not too, yeah, too fast it. and then we'll transition into hey let's start let's start you know we've 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 uncovered the veil of going you guys are all screwed up and we are too well, let's give you some ways to uh mitigate really empower you all so in no particular order, but kind of particular order. So upset stomach, loss of appetite, nausea, and vomiting. So you have these extremes, right? So upset stomach all the way to vomiting. So then we already talked about nervousness, the butterflies, and then true anxiety, uh, yep. bio, biochemical and otherwise. And then you have acid reflux, which happens a lot, especially around yep. salty water. Then it turns into heartburn and ingestion, and then severe case, you do it long enough, you get ulcers, okay? Yeah, yeah. That's an extreme, probably not for our demographic, but it's less of the fire and police guys we deal with. You know, they're in chronic stress every day, and, and that's, a, God bless them, they're just, they're, <laughs> people don't realize the stress that police, fi police officers and firefighters are under on a daily basis. It just, incredible. they don't mm -hmm. get a checkout, okay? Yeah, Same with deployed military. Right. So then you have hunger, like, oh man, I just can't seem to feed that hunger. And then the other side of it is like, you just, like I mentioned, loss of appetite. And then same thing, you have an unquenchable thirst. For some reason, you can't just, then the flip side of that is dry mouth. Or here's the next piece is you get tired. Like all of a sudden, you, like you, and it happens to all of you, probably at some point. You're like, man, it's time to go to the gym. Let me go grab your bag, grab your, your pre-workout, and you're just like dozing off. Your body starts getting very lethargic. You start yawning, okay? You might even get hiccups. Or you're under stress, you start holding your breath, which compounds everything. Hmm. So this is a symptom bank. And the thing I'll just touch on yawning as a transition to, okay, hey, guys, let's start fixing these, some of these issues in, in overstress and overtraining. Yawning is this. Yawning is – people are like, well, what is a yawn? Did it? Yawning is this, especially in a stressful environment. Yawning is your body forcing you to diaphragmatic breathe, yep. to pull in more oxygen, to saturate the hemoglobin to transport oxygen. And so it's like point the layman's is your body's, your brain is saying there's stress coming, start breathing. It's, it's trying to force auto-regulation of deep belly breathing. Yep. That's what yawning is. And you, it comes on obviously when you're tired, but it also comes on at random times of stress and hunger. Right. Guys show up in your morning, not just because it's early to train, but at any point they come in, I, all my athletes start yawning. I'm like, okay. So my first step, and we're transitioning to, okay, guys, what do we do with all these symptoms? When you have to yawn, t just, just own it. Yawn as big as you can. I literally try to yawn before every time I unrack a bar. So deadlift, squat, bench, I try. Th you start thinking about yawning when you want to yawn. Yeah, so I'm about to right now. Yeah. So <laughs> it will. And that's the brain's going brain. It's cause, cause here's the thing is the brain is so powerful. 
The yawn is super powerful. And it's one of the first responses to stress or just trying to get more oxygen. Because the body, we can get to here and we start, we can start just purse breathing, just we don't realize it. And so, and we do that when we're sedentary. So the body will go, it'll just hit the yawn. It'll go, so when you do get as yawn as big as you can. So that's my first step on all these, these stressors we're talking about transitioning into how to fix them. Yeah, that's great. Cause you know, that, that kind of goes right into, you know, when, when you're stressed out or overtraining, really whatever you want to call it, you're overstressed. Um, you, you're symptom sympathetically charged, right? Your, yes. your sympathetic nervous system is charged. And now, the parasympathetic side of your nervous system is saying you you forgot about me and it's going to remind you with those yawns. Yes. Right. And, and that's why, you know, I like to do a nice steady, easy aerobic cardio workout sometimes just to activate that parasympathetic side of your nervous system. And that is a way to the, the sympathetic side to kind of download you know, and perfect. And yeah. And I go into that. So just so you got, and we, by design kind of just know that all of this, and this is where the, we get that slippery slope of not saying always and never, yeah. but almost always these things can be the initiation of getting control of these symptoms is through breathing. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. You Absolutely. can really no, deep note, nasal breathing, belly breathing, Right. And that's where you start like in the, the yoga world, the humming, all these sort of, there's reasons, but we won't get into that totally, yeah. but there's a reason for it. Singing, talking, all those sort of things becomes very lethargic for people, very, or very, uh, not lethargic, very, uh, therapeutic for these people in stress, right? Work, people want to talk and, and, and sing. So step number one, if you get, if you're going to get stressed and you start yawning, own it. Yeah. And keep breathing. Do some box breathing after it. And box breathing is real easy. It's just a four second inhale, four second hold, four second exhale, four second hold, four second inhale. And just yeah. kind of, you just kind of go in a box and you do yeah. a Google search on box breathing. It, it's all over, fucks yeah. all over the internet and you can even practice it and probably buy an app for it. Yeah. You know, there's, 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 the, there's yeah. tons of biofeedback apps now, yeah. but it, the, the really it's like, regard, they all work. Typically, and the reason why they all work is because you take the subconscious of breathing, you, may, you bring it into the conscious, and you become aware of it, and you go, oh, I'm inefficient just for a second. So you start inhaling a little bit longer, and then you exhale a little bit longer, whatever it may be. Basically, my point is, is you start owning the first mechanism, the bi biological mechanism to mitigate this stuff. Yes. It's breathing. Breathing. Number one. Yeah. Number one, yeah. Yeah, besides sleep and, you know, nutrition and breathing, you know. But that's, but the, if, you, if you look at sleep, especially for those of us that are now nose breathers when you sleep or mouth breathe, it doesn't matter. But if you were to, like, see the pace of your breathing when you sleep, it is. It's like a box. You don't, all night, you right. breathe, you hold. You exhale, you hold, right? Unless you have bad sleep apnea or anything. But typically – it is a box breath when you're sleeping. So yeah. we're trying to simulate that sort of parasympathetic activity while we're awake. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. Um, and how about this? Here, here's, here's something that occurs. Um, and this is a pure identifier that you are stressed and that the body is borderline like overstressed near shock. So think about, if you've ever been in a car wreck or if you've ever had a true life or death situation where you, your body thought you were going to die, or your mind thought you were going to die. When you get out of that situation, um, one, everything slows down, right? It's like everything goes in slow motion because your brain is working hundred times faster than it normally does to take all that picture in. And it takes yep. a good snapshot of that. And it's going to remember that moment. Cause it doesn't like want to get a hot stove. Yeah. It doesn't want to get, yeah. It doesn't want to go back to that moment again. And it can trigger a, a response if that moment occurs again, but uh, that's something a little bit down later, but something that you will definitely notice after that situation is you just start shaking, right? You just, your, your legs are shaking and it could be, you know, post presentation, 
right? If you're giving a presentation in front of a thousand people and then you go sit down in your chair and everything's shaking, you know, it's, yep. it doesn't really matter what, what the stressor is. That's just your body's way of basically doing an adrenaline dump. Yeah. It is, it is its way of metabolizing that stress that has been created in your body. So yeah, for sure. There's any of the, you know, biological that just know this ladies and gentlemen is that there's all there here again, this is where the fine line, but this one is there's an always and never with this. There is always a cause and effect with this stuff. There is a, an emotional cause and effect. There's a biological cause and effect and there's a physical cause and effect, you know, and, and, and just know regardless of why that this is normal yes. and, and it's going to happen, but how you choose to deal with it or, and that's where the stress inoculation, that's why let's say if you're do if you, you start, Hey, today I want to go learn jujitsu. If it's a good place, you're as a someone that's trying to get a white belt, you're going to be rolling with white belts or you're going to be rolling with a black belt or purple belt or something that's, that's there to teach you and guide you and mentor, not just beat the hell out of you because it, we need to, we need to ramp that stress up as you can, uh, as you can take it, you know, with a car accident, you don't make those decisions. So you have this big cortisol dump and then your heart rate spikes and then it depletes calcium. That's what, you know, your SA node gets a little bit funky and it depletes your electrolytes, and that's why you feel like you just can't stop shaking. There's a biological effect from that, and that same thing is going to happen to you all the moment breakout of Hell Week happens. There's no way around it, but the beauty is you're going to be like, all right, <laughs> you get through it, get to the next, get to the next meal, get to the next meal, and you'll be able to handle it. And you know, that, that's why Hell Week is, is doable, but, and also why it's so hard. Because you are running on adrenaline all week. Yeah. I mean, there's very little time where you're not fully engaged uh, sympathetically. For sure. You, you know, so you, you, are, you are fully engaged. Um, like Jeff said, you know, it's normal. Um, this is a normal response to stress. And something I also want to uh, mention is, remember I was talking about that car wreck, how everything goes in slow motion and your brain takes that picture of that moment. And it's going to remember every single thing about that moment. It's going to remember smells, sights, sounds, uh, you know, movements, you know, whatever. And sometimes things can trigger that response to occur again. And, you, and it's almost like you, you have a flashback. Flashbacks are normal too. I mean, you, they're a normal response to stress. They're actually a survival skill that we've adapted. So whenever we get into that situation again, our mind has already seen it and we're already prepared for that event to happen again and we can react. You know, yeah. one of the best things I've ever heard uh, that best explains that is like a little deer walking in the woods and then all of a sudden a, a mountain lion jumps out and somehow that deer gets away, right? But it took a snapshot of that moment. Mm -hmm. And so when that deer is taking that little walk again and it smells a certain smell, maybe smells some cat, <laughs> you right. know, here's a little brush go by and is a little more alert than normal. And it could just take off before that mountain lion is even available again. You know, right. so it's just, it's a, it's a survival skill. So you're not crazy that you have flashbacks, yeah. you know, it's just, you just have to realize how do I start dealing with that now? Breathing through it, thinking through it. There's no threat here type of thing. And you know, that is a great way to deal with stress that starts physically that becomes what you think is mental. Yeah. Right? Here, this, here is why buds in the seal community is so wonderful. It is because of all of these instances that you will be exposed to that all your predecessors before you have been exposed to at the end of that training pipeline, it will yield an individual that can train in that environment and learn that environment. Cause we, we don't want to paint stress as a negative it mm -hmm. can be, mm -hmm. but the reason why Navy SEALs special forces units can do this so well under stress is because they're learning under stress and they're taking these snapshots and they're using them. It, it, that is why Stu and I 
have a number of occasions said, hey, guys, like, don't be in a huge rush at 18 to go in the buds. I mean, if you want to do that, we're not saying not do that at 18. We're saying that life will give you skills under stress. And that is what makes our community so wonderful above all above sport and above even the corporate world is like everything you learn is under the auspice of finite decision making under stress over a period of time. Yeah. And so use it. That's why we want, that's why train a good proper training program is so valuable because it's finite stress under great load and stress over time. And if it's a good program, it will yield good results. And, but that's the thing too, is even a bad program will yield good results in comparison to do nothing. But so just, just be very, very clear. We want to stress out the organism as much as we can and then learn from it. We don't want the stress to be so bad that you can never learn from like, like again, the jujitsu piece. I don't want to send my guys to Gustavo here, his place never never doing jujitsu and right away hey black belts i go talk to them i go i just want you to beat the heck out of my student they'll never learn all right and that's what buds does guys showed up and they're like whoa they've never experienced that and they just it's just over sensory overload their their bowl is just spilling over in stress and they don't know how to deal with it and they just like nope it's just easier for me to walk away yeah so we want to stress you guys out yeah, one thing that BUDS allows you to do as well with all the stress that it puts you under and, you know, other programs as well, any military, law enforcement, fire, is you start learning to think in that situation, you know, because a lot of times, and you'll see this many, many times if you're in a situation where it's life or death or high stress, is that you know, there's going to be a group of people that are not thinking at all, but somehow you have that ability to think under pressure, think logically under pressure, think creatively yep. through problems under pressure that yep. weren't planned. You know, these, these are creative ways of thinking. So one thing that I like to do, and I'll put a link into the, into the uh, uh, thing here is I like to add thinking games to our workouts. And there's things that you're going to have to do anyway, like during your rest sets, tie knots, you know, do all your knot tying that you're going to have to do on breath holds at buds, tie all the knots that you have to learn, you know, while yes. you're resting from a, you know, you know, big set of, uh, whatever, you know, running, swimming, um, PT lifting, you know, and, uh, that works really well. Um, I've even pulled out flashcards and they're for my son when he was like seven years old, just basic math you know, addition, subtraction. And it's so funny. You get people doing burpees, right? 10 or 15 burpees. And about halfway into that, I show them a flashcard and it's like brain yep. is not engaged to do no. math right. during a set of burpees yep. <laughs> instead of anything. But um, it, it is a way to really, you'll, you'll start seeing things click when you start doing. That's why I like the, the PT pyramid so much. So if you go up to like one to 10 with pull-ups and back down to one, you know, that's a way, that's a way to do a hundred pull-ups in a workout. It's not that challenging. Yeah. You know, if you're a beginner, it's pretty challenging, but it's a good way to do it. But you can also, you one, you have to remember what set you're on. You have to, you know, while you're tired. And if you want to challenge yourself even further, you say, how many pull-ups have I done? You know, after doing your fifth set, you know, you got to do your math one plus two plus three plus four. Yep. You know, eventually you're going to remember it because I, I do this all the time, you know, but um, anyway, there, there's just some other ways that you can, like I said, engage that thinking part of the brain while stress and it, it, it you can train for it, you know, yep. so. And that's yeah. the beauty is that the, the more you do this, you'll re what, what will happen eventually is that your brain will be so accepting of problem solving under duress that you actually will get. And that's, again, we're talking about the Delta pattern of the brain the, called the flow state. Yeah. It's or the zone. There is a point of stress that happens where the brain is best. And again, those, that's when X athlete is performing at this amazing level at sport with consistency. Again, that's the seal community, especially the <laughs> community I came from is that the individuals there were trained so well, mentored so well, guided so well and they had the capacity to make decisions under great stress so we turned into this individual that could really problem solve under duress and that's what 
That's why physical activity, you know, PT, whatever it is, weight training, resistance training, swimming, if it's done and delivered very, very well, it transfers. If we're just, if we just have a bunch of sandbags and we're having to move from one place to the other, there may not be a lot of transfer. Now there's a time for those sort of extra training, just that gut check and just grind. But a lot of the training, if it's a good plan and it's executed and your body mechanics are good, what ends up happening is that really transfers because your brain doesn't get so stressed out. It starts going, wait a minute, I can make these decisions. And again, it's move, just the SEAL community or the tactical community is, you know, uh, move, communicate, shoot, shoot, communicate, move, or whatever, whatever order you want to put that in is that needs to be able to happen. You need to be able to stress yourself out, make decisions, and then move on. Yeah. And communicate. I mean, communicate yeah. is, is really difficult yeah. because one, you have to speak. And if someone's speaking, you have to hear. Yeah. I mean, like our but, team leaders and troop commanders of the command, they had the Peltor headsets. They had four channel or two channels they had to monitor, but they had, they were each ear had a different person talking to them. So you could have someone talking to one of the team leaders could be talking to the troop commander. Hey, we're moving to this building, this set point. And over here, he's listening to this AC-130 gunship going, hey, I've got guys moving from the northeast at 300 meters. So he's got to like switch between channels and communicate to like, hey, guys, we got guys coming. You know what I mean? So it can get a little bit crazy. But you have the right people doing it. And he's been exposed to it the right way and had great mentors and great leaders and not to mention buds and everything else. It just develops this individual. And that's what we're, we're trying to de develop you all as, as a whole individual and not just a PT monster. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. <clears throat> um, well, how about this? How about things to avoid eating or drinking when you are at a high stress or, um, you know, overtraining borderline symptom? Yep. And, and that's a good segue because here's, here's the thing. It's kind of crazy and it's a short story. I'll keep it short. So your SA node is your pacemaker of your heart. Pretty important little nerve, okay? Yeah. Your bicep, not super important, but you need it. <laughs> your, your, as, as the nerve bundles come down from your spinal, go down your spinal cord, they shoot out, and that's where those nerve innervations are that control your SA node and your bicep. Not the same one, but just they, my point is, is there's one nerve intervention for your bicep, there's one for your SA node. And you're like, wait a minute, they're kind of, they're being treated equally. Right. Weirdly, they are, but there is one, one group of muscles that is not. It's your stomach has seven. It's the only one. Wow. So you're talking about when we experience stress, one of the first things that we encounter is this, is this litmus of, I call them physical manifestations of GI stress, right? They just, again, so we're like, why is it like every time I get stressed out, I want to yawn or I got to urinate or I got, I got diarrhea or I, I get loss of appetite or lethargy. It's gut health. It's what's going on in the gut. So to answer your question is, you know, what we want to do is like, if, if you're going to try to mitigate it, we got to find something initially. And Stu already talked about it. Find something that your body isn't going to go, wait a minute, that's, I'm going to eat this or drink this. And that's going to create more work. We, so we got to find something that's easy on the stomach. That's, that's, and so right now it's like, well, shoot, like, what is that? I don't know. I know what mine is. Right. And it's, it's funny because I used to think I knew what it was. And then a buddy of mine who's a power lifter who has to consume seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 calories a day, is just sick of eating. He's like, well, Hey, the bodybuilding world or the powerlifting world, or like some of the athletes will use this, this, and this. And that's why if you look at like Pedialyte, it's glucose base, not sucrose or fructose base, because glucose doesn't take any energy to convert. It's immediately absorbed in the bloodstream. Yeah. Or like a glucose tab. So definitely find something. And you, for you, it's like, it, it's perfect. It's a banana, it's a natural fruit, fruit source, and some juice. It doesn't take a lot of energy. So the, we, we forget about that. Anything that goes in your mouth, into your stomach, your body actually has to do work because the muscle will, muscles in the stomach contract, the intestines, everything. They've got to actually do work to digest. We don't want to do a lot of work. Right. Until we have some time where we can. Like, hey, I've got an hour or two. I can eat something. Right. right. So that's my first suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. Listen to your gut. You know, yep. like, like I said, that, there's a term, you know, listen to your gut because uh, yep. there's a reason. Yes, you know? absolutely there is. Yeah. Yep. 
So yeah, that's, that's where I would, I would start looking at. And then, and then not because that's the, the, like the only thing to do, but it's like, like anything else, it's the, it's a good starting point. Now, if you already kind of have it figured out, now you've got, you've got basically two steps ahead of your, 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 your peer group. So once you have determined, yep, that's what works for me. And I know that's what I'm going to use when I go to buds. Boom. Problem solved. Yeah. Uh, something too, is you got to consider, you know, your number one recovery tool is sleep and anything yeah. that you eat or drink that interferes with sleep needs to be considered as well. Uh, yes. like, like your t-shirt, what's that say? Caffeine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Caffeine, yeah. nicotine, alcohol, you know, all of those, uh, don't necessarily make for a good night's sleep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Stimulants if, if, and depressants if, for sure. If done too close to your bedtime. Now there's nothing wrong with caffeine in the morning. If you need a little bit in the afternoon, that's fine too. Just yeah. you know, everything in moderation. For sure. Obviously. And that's, yeah, we can kind of get it and not want to get in the weeds too much of that, but just understand that, mm-hmm. you know, all sleep is not created equal just because you're asleep doesn't necessarily mean you're resting. Cause I think about if, if you wake up in the morning and you're just, you don't feel rested at all. That is an indicator. Yeah. It, it really is. And th- there's a lot of reasons why you might not be sleeping well. Um, and that's kind of one of those topics that I'm going to, we're going to probably end up tackling a little bit more, but just again, this is just, we want you, the reason all this is like we're pulling the veil off. We just want to open dialogue. And so you guys can start thinking critically because at some point, especially at buds, you're going to have to make these assessments and these decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, it's, it's good to have some, you know, understanding of what is happening to you physiologically, you know, when you are overtraining, when you are overstressed, because once again, it is a physiological reaction that you're going to notice first. Yeah. Um, and if it's not taken care of, it can get into bigger mental and, uh, psychological issues. And, you know, that, like I said, it can lead into a, a pure depression. Um, you know, you, you name it, you know, you can yeah. think you're crazy because you're having these, these thoughts and flashbacks and, you know, you can't handle it. So it's, uh, it, it right. is, it is real out there. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, I get a little frustrated when I hear people say there's no such thing as overtraining. Um, and, you know, I guess the word itself they might be right, you know, but at the same time, you know, the symptoms are real. Uh, stress is real. Yeah, and the effects of those symptoms are very real in performance. Yes, a- absolutely. And then, you know, I, I, I still use the word overtraining because it just makes sense. I can't think of another yeah. word that better describes it. Be yeah. It, well, it's a little more clear than saying under recovered. Yeah. Over because overtraining typically is symptomatic of you've just put too much. Again, it's like diet. Like I want to lose weight. Well, your calories higher you're consuming than you need to your output. So recovery is kind of the same way or performances. If your work capacity is so very high that you can't recover from that, come back to equilibrium. Yep. So saying here's your workload goes up, right? Stress, stress, whatever. And you can't quite, it keeps doing this eventually that separation is going to be greater and greater and greater. And again, we kind of talked about last time, you don't have to spend hours and hours of doing recovery um, as it's an own, own modality, but sleep is, is, is the number one performance enhancing drug, if you want to call it that, right? (laughs) It is by far the best. And if we are, here's the thing about sleep and I'll keep this short is that, I'm giving you averages, not absolutes. We'll say the average person sleeps nine hours a night. In in that nine hour window, your body will experience REM, rapid eye movement sleep, three times. That's it. On average, a person will. Maybe four if you're a super sleeper. But you're only going to hit REM for three to four minutes each one of those peaks. It's three peaks over nine hours. In that three, those three peaks, we'll call it nine minutes. In that nine minutes, your body produces almost, almost 100% of all the hormones necessary for recovery, optimal brain recovery, physical recovery, GI distress recovery. So the norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, insulin-like growth factor, um, mitigation of cortisol, vitamin D, all those sort of things. That's when you talk about metabolism. 
that nine minutes is all you get. Right. If you start omitting those three minutes here, two minutes here, or whatever it is, at some point your body is going to go, whoa, wait a minute. And that's what we want you to guys start looking at is, okay, well, yeah, well, like people, I call this, I do great on six hours. Well, just same thing. It makes me, it makes me want to pull my hair out because if you can only get six hours because there's, there's certain time constraints of travel or work for a period of time. And I get it. Like I'm a father, right? Yeah, and I, and I sure. work and there's sort of things like I get it. Sometimes I can only get six or seven hours of sleep, but if I can get nine, I'm going to get nine. If I can yeah. get 10, I'm going to get 10. If I only get seven, I get, we get the human body is so resilient that it'll put up with four hours. I, I went with three and four hours of sleep for eight years. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it was right. And that's what we're trying to get you guys to not make the same mistakes we did. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, a power nap works really well. I, yeah, I usually yeah. set, you know, if you're a really good sleeper, I usually set my watch for 21 minutes. Yeah. And I start it and I literally, if I'm, if I'm feeling like I need a nap, you know, I can fall asleep in a minute and a half, two minutes, at least be out of some conscious level and, you know, get a good, hopefully get one of those rapid eye movements in that session. Yep. You know, if I can do that, I, I can wake up pretty refreshed. I do what's called a caffeine nap. And it's, yeah. it's actually a thing. And yep. I didn't know it was a thing until about a year and a half ago. Yeah, I heard a new nickname for that was the Nappuccino. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, so I take, you know, I'll take a Monster or something a little bit less caffeine. Like I use Strike Force or whatever it is, but Monster's fine. Because Tally just sent it to my house. I don't have to buy it. So <laughs> I'll just use Monster. Um, and uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll sit down because I'm tired. I know I need to go work out or get productive. I'll drink it and I'll lay down on the couch or sit and close my eyes. Well, in about 20, 25 minutes, I've, 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 I've had a time to turn my brain off. Yep. I've started to rest and the cat and may, sometimes even fall asleep like you. And then yep. the caffeine kicks in and I wake up. I'm like, it's win-win, man. I'm just ready yes. to go. Yes. So I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Now, Nappuccino. The Nappuccino. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's in, you know, we get it for you all. It's very difficult, which is why we're getting such a positive response from you all. We get it. There's a lot of, we'll call it nonsense, that you guys all have to filter through, and, and it sucks. So that's why we're trying to do our best to, to get between Stu and I's uh, YouTube pages, trying to get as much positive information for you all to dig through, use as you can. If it doesn't apply to you, it doesn't apply to you, but at some point it may. Right. So that's what we're just trying to give you guys some, some good, solid ideas based off of experience, anecdotal evidence, and even you know science. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So anyway, that's stress. If you guys questions about it and you think you're in that zone of overtraining, overstressed, you know, send us an email, you know, our contacts in the, uh, in the description there. And, um, uh, you know, happy to, uh, you know, give you some help if you need it, you know, yep. so, you know, give you some advice or link you to, you know, some information that's out there that might help you even more. So, and I think that the, like the last, my last piece is like the population of you all that are commenting and responding. That for me has been one of the most valuable resources of people ask me a question. I'm able to go into the comments and say, Hey, take a look at this comment. And then those guys start corresponding and start working some stuff out too. It's not that we don't want to answer, but between Stu and I's YouTube pages, there's a, there's a lot of robust comments and questions that have answered a lot of these questions in great detail. So just uh, by, by all means, shoot us questions, but look, look at the comments that have been left on a lot of these videos and you'll find a lot of answers beyond what we've given. Yeah. All right, Jeff, once again, thank you very much. Yes, sir. This is a good one. Yeah. And we will uh, do this again. Yeah, sorry for uh, being late on my timeline. That was uh, I, my own self-imposed stress before I, I started this thing. So. Yes, but you were helping others. So that's, a, that's good. All right. All, right. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks a lot.